How's it going everybody? In this video, we are going to discuss a little bit about how BGP works in terms of its normal operations and nothing specific to SD-WAN. But we're gonna discuss basically how it works to a certain level, talk about some of the different types of BGP that are out there. Because I don't, again, like OSPF, I don't want to assume everybody's coming here with like a CCMP level of understanding. So we're gonna dive into that a little bit and understand the high level pieces to how BGP works and some stuff like that. And then we'll focus on getting a BGP up and running in the next video and all the details. Cause and I'll basically lay out what it is I'm gonna go do and stuff like that. So you'll be aware of those things when we start diving into them. So let's talk a little bit about how BGP works operationally. Cause that's really important if you're gonna wanna deal with this within any, any production environment. So, Basically, the way that I like to refer to it, let me switch my color order to orange real quick, is you have different, two different types of BGP. You have iBGP, which is internal BGP. In other words, this is going to be BGP that you run inside of your environment to do whatever it is you need it to do. This could be something like you use over DMVPN. You can use it in your environment to influence routing. And so there's a lot, a lot of different things that it can be used to do. There's also eBGP, which is external. And this is where you, this is the type of BGP that you're gonna use to connect to us another autonomous system or another BGP speaker that's not inside of your autonomous system. So this is typically what you're gonna to use to connect to the internet with and to connect to an MPLS service provider and so on and so forth. So how this specifically work with eBGP is we actually have eBGP peerings with all these guys to the MPLS WAN, right? We're doing all of these peerings on the V edges to here as well as the, the DC switch, right? They're all peering to the provider through eBGP. And the cool thing about that is we're, we're advertising the local subnet into BGP as well so that we can route towards it. In this particular case, the the connected subnet is advertised so that we can build reachability in the underlay. And that works out great because it gets us connectivity. We know where to point to and we get there all day long. Everything is golden. Now, in terms of how you can use BGP internally, there's a number of ways that you can pull this off. Again, we've already mentioned it. If you have like, for example, a traditional IP-based WAN that you're using over the internet or via MPLS, for example, you could run DMBPN over the top. So DMBPN is used to build a connectivity between your branch offices and your hub and spoke environment and your HQ or your data centers. And then you would run a dynamic routing protocol over the top. So a lot of companies that I've worked with run EIGRP for obvious reasons because it makes more sense to use than something like OSPF or RIP but they can also use BGP. You can use BGP and I've used BGP in scenarios where I've got more than a few hundred spokes where EIGRP just seems to get wonky after a few hundred prefixes being learned, especially if you're learning like 20 plus prefixes per site and if you've got 300 sites, that's 6,000 routes, right? So that's a lot of routes to be learning in. EIGRP, even though it, now I've heard claims that it can do more than that, it seems to be kind of wonky. BGP seems to have no problem handling those larger routing tables. So in BGP scenarios, you would, for example, you'd have your DMVPN cloud, right? And then you would have all of your nodes connect to DM, the DMVPN cloud, right? And everything would be, everybody would be hunky-dory, right? And then you would just, for example, you would join everybody to the same BGP autonomous system number. Let's say you were, you were to use 65,001, for example. So if every site's running 65,001, what ends up happening, let me finish writing this out real quick. They are all iBGP peers, right? So if this is your hub site, right? And these guys are both running uh, the DMVPN tunnel on it. What would end up happening is you would point VH3, VH4, and VH5 to the VH1 and VH2 as the, as the hubs. And you would form BGP peerings over that and get everything up and running. It would be all 
all good, right? Then you would start advertising your routes via BGP over the, um, in B you could advertise whatever connected subnets are there, or you could like take your IGP, for example, and then redistribute into BGP, and then BGP would then propagate that to, like if this was a spoke, then you could propagate that to your hub, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of different ways to accomplish it. What we're going to be doing in our particular example is I'm going to actually create loopbacks on VEDGE1 and VEDGE2 and the idea is those loopback addresses are going to get created via template and then they're going to get advertised into OSPF. Once they're advertised via OSPF, Switch 16 should be able to learn that. Because the switch will learn it, what will end up happening is we can configure switch 16 and VH1 and switch 16 and VH2 to form an IBGP peering between, let me make that a little I, IBGP peering to each one of the V edges. So we'll form a BGP peering here, an IBGP peering specifically, and then an IBGP peering here. And then what we can do is any routes that we learn in, we can actually propagate those into BGP, and BGP can propagate those down into switch 16. Switch 16 can then learn them. Now, by default, we have OSPF running. What is the administrative distance for, B for OSPF out of the gate? Well, you guessed it right, it's 110. So what is the IBGP administrative distance? It's 200, right? So in order to have BGP be the determining factor on a Cisco switch to determine which V edge you forward your traffic to, you need to affect switch 16's ability and it's uh, how it's actually going to read the routing table. In other words, we're going to go, we could either drop the BGP administrative distance to be something less than 110, or we could drive up the administrative distance on OSPF to be greater than 200, so like 201. So we could either drop this one down to 109, or we could raise this one up to 201. Either way we do it, I prefer to do OSPF, modify it first, and because then it, it raises its value up to 201, and then BGP automatically gets injected into the routing table. We don't have to fight with BGP. At the end of the day, which way you go with it, it's up to you. Uh, one way is not better than the other. It's just personal preference on which direction you go. The cool thing about doing that is then the BGP routes get installed in the routing table, and then on the V edges, you can affect how the traffic will be forwarded to the V edges by doing that. So then the switch 16 will say, okay, I see routes from V edge one, and I see routes from V edge two. Now I need to make a determining factor. So you could, if you wanted to have it send traffic out both, but in most cases, you're going to want to send traffic out one V edge over the other in a kind of a hot standby type of scenario to where let's say you prefer V edge one as your egress point, but then if V edge one goes down for some reason, you know, let's say the power goes out of that site, you can immediately have traffic fail over to V edge two and then V edge two will be your new egress point. So there are multiple ways of accomplishing this goal. If you want to do that, there's a common thing called local preference that you could use on your V edges to affect the traffic, how it leaves the OSPF domain, or I should say uses BGP to get to the, the V edges. We're gonna talk about that. We're actually gonna create a policy in the command line on V edge one, and then we'll uh, configure it through what they call local policy. So it's a local control policy on V edge two. This will be the first time we've really dove into it in this course, but the reason why I focused on bringing that out of like the policy section is because it's got to get created, number one, and it doesn't affect everybody, right? Because when we talk about the centralized control policy at a later set of videos, that's going to be something specific to centralized control, where when we talk about localized control, you're affecting how OSPF or how BGP will be operational on the V edges. So we'll take a look at exactly how that comes into play and talk about those details when we get there. I'm not going to do a deep dive in policies before I get there, but I will highlight the areas that we need to be aware of when we get to that point. But that's basically what will end up happening. And the cool thing is we'll be able to set up a BGP peering from loopback to loopback on the V edges and the switch 16. So why, why would you do that? Well, the number one reason is 
if you have more than one way. In this case here, we don't. It's like one, if the, the interface goes down, we're pretty much out of luck. But in more, uh, more common environments, let me go ahead and clear the screen up real quick and get out of the way. In more common environments, you would have like vEdge 1 and you'd have vEdge 2, for example. You'd have, let's say you have core switch 1 and core switch 2, and you'd have like, say, access 1, access 2, and you'd have access 3, right? And then these guys would all be connected like so, and then connected like this, probably a port channel there, and then you would have connections going this direction. So you'd have a lot of link redundancy and resiliency built in. So in the event that something happened in the network, you could send traffic this way if you wanted to. But if something happened with this link or this core switch died or something along those lines, if you've got more than one physical link to reach that loopback, then you could, instead of routing this way, you would route this way and then up. Or you could, if this switch itself died, you could route this way. And that would work all day long as well. So the idea is to provide as many, an uplink to each upstream device that you need to provide redundancy for, so an alternative path. Is that path gonna be less preferred? Probably, or it might be even equal cost multipathing, or you could affect it in some way or fashion. It's really up to you and how you wanna move forward in your design, but the options are there. And that's basically what you could do. In this design here, we don't really have that set up to allow for multiple switches and to affect the traffic on both sides and do the, the, the handwritten drawing, but by doing the demo on VEdge 1 and 2 to switch 16, I'm still gonna be able to show you generally what, I'm, what I mean, but just imagine you have another switch sitting here, right there that connects to VEdge 1 and VEdge 2, and these guys are connected to each other with the port channel. So if you have BGP pairings between here and here, and then you have a BGP pairing between VEdge 1 and 2, and you know let's say switch 3, for example, then if you have another device sitting over here that's equally connected up to both of these and something happens to this guy, then you could route this direction, for example, or route this direction. So the idea is to provide alternative paths for your north-south north traffic or your uh, east-west traffic, depending on which direction you're trying to get to. That's really the power here. So is it anything new in networking? Is this a new fangled design? No, it's been around for years. It's just one of those things where you have to take into consideration how the current network is operating and then go through and take into consideration those details. So I'm just gonna be showing you something that almost any CCMP level engineer would, would more than likely already be comfortable with, with dealing with internal BGP and then setting up peerings to both and then you can affect the traffic that way. So that's pretty much how that works. We're gonna go through those details and get everything up and running in the next video. I want to thank you guys for hanging out with me in this video, and I will catch you guys in the next video. I keep on saying video for some reason. I'll see you guys next time.